Well, good evening, uh, students and trainer mentors. Uh, it's hard to believe, but this is our 15th sec uh, session together this fall. We began on September 8th, and we're already up to December 15th. I don't know how that, how that happens, but time really flies. It's been my privilege to be your teacher through this Old Testament survey course, and I trust it's been a, a good experience for you. Just wanted to thank Harry Olson, uh, our visionary and leader for this program. Really appreciate, appreciate Harry's contact uh, with me a couple of years ago about this opportunity. And Lewis Mann, our academic dean, thanks Lewis for um, encouraging us and directing this program. Appreciate Chris Thompson, our technical director, and all that he has done to keep this uh, uh, program being distributed and uh, all of you connected. I appreciate the work of Josh Olson, who is our webmaster and then been posting the notes and the and the study questions. And all you trainer mentors, uh, you've been there with these students and encourage them. And I want to thank the students as well. It's been a great time. And uh, tonight we, we wrap up our, uh, our time together for this fall in this class. Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for uh, the technology that allows us to minister in this way and to share the truth of your divinely inspired and inerrant word. And I, the Holy Spirit has been working in the lives of these students to encourage them, to prepare them for ministries, and I know that the Holy Spirit will continue to confirm the, the truth of your word. And Lord, we just pray you might guide us and direct us tonight. May it be a good and profitable time together as we consider these prophetic books. In the strong name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Well, before we get into the study, just wanted to introduce my new little granddaughter, Abigail Rose Geilenfeld. Uh, she was uh, born about three weeks ago, and my wife Nancy and I had the chance to go down to Little Rock, Arkansas, and to get acquainted with her, and she is just a little dear. This is Aaron, her dad, and Laura, my daughter, and a little Abigail Rose's mother. So we just had a wonderful time uh, with our family and uh, getting acquainted. And this is my wife Nancy with our daughter and our little granddaughter. So just that little personal uh, sharing with you um, in light of the joy that the Lord has brought us. Well, I want to tell you a little story as we get into the book of Micah. Long ago, there was an ancient Israelite who longed to have a son. And every day he prayed with his barren wife that Yahweh would hear their prayer and give them a child. Other Israelites in the village suggested they might approach the priest of Baal with this concern for a child. Perhaps they could stir this, this God of fertility to send them a son. Others suggested that they might go to the grove of Asherah and beseech her for the answer. It was even suggested by an idolatrous Israelite that Moloch, the fiery God, would give them their son if they promised to dedicate it to this idol. But they refused. They refused to return to idols and kept praying that Yahweh, the God of Israel, would answer their prayer. Then one spring day, word spread through the village that indeed the one barren wife was expecting a child. And when a son was born late that fall, the neighbors said together, Mika Yahweh, Mika Yahweh, who is like Yahweh, the great God of Israel, in answering prayer. And so the child was called Micah, an abbreviated form of the Hebrew question, Mika Yahweh, who is like Yahweh? And the answer, of course, is that nobody is. No God of Canaan was as great and powerful as the God of Israel in answering prayer. Well, it may have been circumstances like that that led to the naming of this prophet, this prophet called Micah. We remember him especially as the barefoot prophet. <laughs> He went around barefoot. He was also a prophet who was fond of puns, little word plays, and we'll see that in a moment. And he's the only prophet whose writing ministry was directed both to the north and to the south. There were other prophets that spoke to the north and the south, but only his prophecy mentions both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But let's take a look at the basic facts on this important book. The author, Micah, his name means, who is like Yahweh? It's a rhetorical question, and the implied answer is, nobody. No God 
is as great, as good, as powerful as the God of Israel. The writing ministry of this prophet Micah was directed to both the northern and the southern kingdoms, as we see uh, by the mention of their capitals in verse 1 of the book of Micah. The date of writing, we're going to date this book between 735 and 700 BC. Micah ministered during the days of the Assyrian menace. The moral and spiritual condition of the nation, actually both kingdoms, was at an all-time low. Religion was a matter of mere outward form, and the religious establishment itself was corrupt. Idolatry, injustice, avarice was widespread. So Micah addressed himself to these wrongs, and he championed the cause of the oppressed. His contemporaries at the time he ministered included Hosea ministering to the north, Amos ministering to the north, and Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, ministering to the southern kingdom. Why did he write? The purpose, I believe, was to encourage repentance by threats of judgment and reassurances that God's purposes for his people would finally prevail. So kind of a negative message calling the people to repentance, but also an encouraging one that God's purposes will be accomplished for his people in spite of the judgment to come. The theme is the approaching repentance, uh, that should be the reproaching judgment on all nations, on, the, on all kingdoms, and the ultimate deliverance by the Messiah. The approaching judgment on both kingdoms, the north and the south, and the ultimate deliverance by the Messiah. We saw this double idea in the book of Isaiah. Judgment and deliverance. Judgment on the wicked, deliverance of the righteous. Under theology, Micah teaches that true religion is not a matter of mere outward form and conformity to external ritual, but a life lived according to the principles of justice, loyalty, and humility. And we're going to look at that in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. The key word in this book is the word Shema, to hear. And this word Shema introduces the, uh, each, one of the, um, each one of the messages of this book. Uh, and the, uh, the address, uh, this book is addressed to the northern kingdom, whose capital as, is at Samaria, and there we see Ahab's palace, and the southern kingdom, whose palace uh, and capital is there at Jerusalem. And we see that in verse 1, where Micah of Moresheth is uh, going to share this vision about Samaria, capital of the north, and Jerusalem, capital of the south. You might wonder why Micah went barefoot and naked. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, the, the answer to that is that the enemy was coming, the Assyrians were coming, and Micah illustrated in his own life what was going to happen to the people. They would be stripped of their clothing, their sandals would be taken, and they'd be hauled off to captivity barefoot and naked. So Micah exemplified that in the way he dressed, or in fact, the way he undressed. Most likely, he didn't; uh, he wasn't completely naked. That would have been uh, unacceptable uh, to Jewish people in that day. Probably wore some kind of a loincloth, but without his outer robe. Uh, so that's Micah. Uh, it looks like Tarzan, but it's really Micah <laughs> going barefoot and naked as a sign of judgment, the coming judgment uh, through the Assyrians. And as he begins his, his, uh, his message here, he introduces some word plays. In verses 10 through 15, he's giving us some word plays about the coming judgment on the territory of Judah and uh, also on Israel. But he mentions certain cities of Judah they are going to fall to the Assyrians. And he, he makes word plays by... Uh, referring to these cities and uh, talking about what's going to happen to them. It's kind of like a city named Cannon Falls will fall to the cannon, or High Town will be made low. And so that's the kind of thing he's doing. He says, Weep not at all at Bethel Arpha, <clears throat> roll yourself in dust. 
Beth El Arfa means house of dust. House of dust, roll yourself in dust. In other words, he's predicting humiliation to this place noted for its dust. And then about Shafir, beauty town, he says, go your way, inhabitant of Shafir. That means beauty town. But he says, in shameful nakedness. In other words, they're going to be taken captive as slaves. And uh, this beautiful town is going to become ugly and uh, enslaved. Zanon means going out. And uh, the Zanon will be going out, going out to captivity. So he's making some word plays here, trying to illustrate what's going to happen to these cities of Judah when the Assyrians come. And what they can expect is mentioned in verse 16. He says, make yourself bald, cut off your hair for your children of your delight, extend your baldness like the eagle, for they will go from you into exile. <clears throat> That's what he's anticipating, the coming judgment on the Israelites through exile. And in Deuteronomy 24, we noted that exile was the ultimate judgment for breaking God's covenant the covenant God had enacted with his people. You wonder why God is going to do this and why Israel and Judah deserved this severe judgment of exile. Well, you find the answer to that question in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And here we see the reasons for the coming judgment. <clears throat> They're coveting the fields and seizing them. They're rejecting God's word. They're not heeding the message of the prophet. They're plundering people. Uh, they strip the robe off the unsuspecting passers-by. And they're oppressing the widow, the orphan, and the poor. You're evicting uh, the widow from her pleasant house. And from her children, you take my splendor forever. So here we see the reasons for the coming judgment. Coveting, rejecting God's word, plundering uh, people who pass through their land and oppressing the poor. You can see God was uh, was going to bring judgment, and he warned of this to encourage the people to repent. In chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he goes from the message of judgment to a message of hope and a promise of a better time. Some people have suggested that these words in verses 12 and 13, since they're so different, from the message of judgment. They must be the messages of the false prophets promising peace and hope in a time when God's going to judge. But you recall in Isaiah, God announced judgment on his people, but he also promised there would be a future day when his people would be blessed and they would be a repentant people. I think the same thing is going on here as he promises a future day of blessing. And in verse 13, he says, the breaker goes before them. And he breaks out. They break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. So their king goes before them. Notice that in verse 16. The breaker and then the king. So uh, this speaks of the regathering of his people as a repentant remnant. They're going to be gathered. They're going to be assembled, verse 12. They're going to be gathered once again together. But then he mentions that a breaker will go before them. Who is this breaker who prepares the way for the coming king? Well, that's, a, that's a, a question that can be answered, I believe, as we look to the New Testament. The breaker, the one who broke out, and the, the illustration there is the idea of a sheep pen that is kind of makeshift, and the sheep are put in there during the night, but in the morning, someone has to break open the sheep pen to let the sheep out. Who is the one who prepares the way for others to follow? And we believe that that was most likely, oops, most likely John the baptizer. He's the breaker who goes before them. And then their king uh, leads the people. The breaker goes before them. They break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. So their king goes before them. The breaker prepares the way for the coming king. There's some debate as to the breaker. Is it, is it a, should, should it be understood as a reference to John or Jesus? I suggest that John was the breaker. He was the one who led a time of repentance that prepared the people to follow King Jesus, as we see here in the royal entry. So this takes us out of the time of judgment in the past and anticipates the coming of John the baptizer, 
and King Jesus. Now in chapter 3 he begins the second address and notice that he begins with the word hear. The word hear has the idea of not just listening with your ears but paying attention and obeying. And he condemns the leaders here. He condemns the national leaders for their injustice. And God delights in justice, but we see these national leaders abhor it and ignore it. And we see this in verse 1, and again in verse 8, and finally in verse 9. So these rulers are denounced. These leaders of the nation are denounced. And uh, they, they say, um, he says in verse 2, You who hate good and love evil and tear off the skin from them, and their flesh from the bones who eat the flesh of my people. This is a reference to the leaders that are taking advantage of the people instead of serving them. And these leaders are condemned. But he also condemns the false prophets mentioned in verses 5 through 8. He talks about the prophets who lead my people astray. Obviously that's a reference to the false prophets. And these false prophets uh, are, are leaving the people defenseless and, and uh, abused like sheep that are being killed by the wolves. And so these false prophets and these leaders are denounced for what they have done and are doing to the people. So the prophet says to these false prophets that they can expect darkness, calamity, and distress. Therefore it shall be night for you without vision, darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets. Notice the prophets aren't going to have visions. They're false prophets, and so the Lord is going to take away uh, any kind of vision from them. It'll be a time of spiritual darkness in the future. In contrast to these false prophets that, the, that um, Micah condemns, he presents his own credentials in verse 8. Notice in chapter 3, verse 8, on the other hand, that is in contrast with the false prophets, he says, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage. And here we see that Micah has credentials, God's credentials. What does he have? He has power, God's power. He has the Spirit of the Lord. He has a sense of justice, verse 8, and courage. These are Micah's credentials, and I think that uh, these are credentials that we can aspire to as well as uh, God's as leaders of God's people. God's power, God's spirit, a sense of justice, and courage to speak the truth in the face of, of opposition. In verse 9 he begins to denounce all the rulers, the rulers, the priests, and the prophets, and uh, he, he condemns them all. And then notice verse 12, he says, on account of you, the false prophets and the selfish rulers and the uh, idolatrous priests, he says in verse 12, therefore on account of you Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. Micah was the first prophet to threaten the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And here it is in chapter 3 verse 12. He's threatening the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and that in fact happened. That in fact happened eventually when the Babylonians uh, came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. We come to chapter 4 and it will come about in the last days. Micah now looks ahead from the time in which he lived to what we know as the last days or the messianic era. He looks ahead to the kingdom when Messiah will return and rule and reign. And what's he say about the future? He says, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. Many nations will come and say, let us come up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. Well, the mountain that is being talked about here is Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac, and David built the altar, and Solomon built the temple. And he's saying that in the last days there will be a future worship center in this messianic era, era, and people will come there to celebrate the feasts and to worship God. But not only that, he says the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem in that day. 
and Jerusalem will be a center for worship and a center for, for teaching. It's going to be a wonderful time. And Micah speaks of the blessings that will come in that day, the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. And notice that he promises that he will, they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. He says they'll sit each under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. And there'll be a time of, of great gathering of the remnant of God's people. He's going to gather the outcasts and make the lame a remnant and the outcast, a strong nation. He's going to bring his people, God's people, back to their homeland. I like that reference to beating the swords into plowshares. There is a monument dedicated to peace in Jerusalem. It's called the Abbey Nathan Peace Memorial. And at the foot of this rock column are military weapons that have been all welded together on one side and out the other side you see implements of peace, implements of warfare, machine guns and military implements are all molded together and out the other side come the implements of agriculture and that uh, really picks up on the theme that we see here. It's trying to illustrate the theme that we see here. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But before that happens, before that time of great peace and prosperity comes, before that time of kingdom blessing comes with Messiah ruling and reigning, he promises that there's going to be suffering. In chapter 4, verse 9, he says, now. So he kind of takes us from the future back to the present. Now. And the now is talking about the time when Micah was anticipating that God would send his people into exile. Now they're going to be taken into exile. But they will be rescued, he says in verse 10. You'll go to Babylon, but you will be rescued. So he's not only talking about the exile to Babylon, but the rescue, the return from Babylon, led by Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel as a result of the decree of Cyrus allowing the Jews to return to their homeland. And then as he continues on, he says, Now muster yourself in troops, verse 1 of chapter 5, they have laid siege against us. This takes us back to the thought of verse 9 and the attack by enemy on Jerusalem. But whose invasion is this? Who are these troops that come against Jerusalem? Some have thought the reference to the uh, king being smitten on his cheek might be a reference to Jesus being crucified. But remember, we're talking about the time in which, which Michael lived. The king who was smitten in the, in the time uh, of the Old Testament period was the last king of Judah, King Zedekiah. And King Zedekiah was the one who was smitten. He was the one who was humbled. Remember, he was arrested. He was, his sons were killed before his very eyes, and then he was blinded and taken off into Babylonian captivity. It was a terrible thing to have the last king of Judah smitten like this. But in contrast to that smitten king, that last king of Judah, Micah promises there's a messianic king coming. He goes from verse 1 of chapter 5 to the smitten king, Zedekiah, to verse 2, the Messianic king. And so he says there's going to be trouble, but then there'll be a time when the Messiah will, will come. And here we're introduced to Messiah. But as for you, Bethlehem, and here we see where the Messiah will be born. Bethlehem. Who's the one who's going to be born there? He describes him as God incarnate. He says, from you will go forth one from me to be ruler. This is God going forth. And what will he do? He's going to shepherd his flock. He's going to shepherd his people. So here in verses 2 through 4 of chapter 5, we see the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be God incarnate. And he's going to shepherd the people. Now there's a great Christmas sermon in that if you're looking for a Christmas sermon. Jesus born in Bethlehem. He's God incarnate. He's the good shepherd of his people. If you're looking for a good outline, there it is.
he adds that he's going to be born in Bethlehem Ephrathah. Why Bethlehem Ephrathah? Well, the word Ephrathah distinguishes the Bethlehem of Judea from another Bethlehem up in Galilee, mentioned in Joshua 19, verse 15. So there were two Bethlehems. There's one in Judea, Bethlehem Ephrathah. And the other one is up in, in Galilee. So Messiah is going to shepherd his people. He's going to be the good shepherd. And he's going to shepherd the flock. And later on we see in John chapter 10, Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. That's what the shepherd does. He sacrifices himself for the sheep. And then in verses 5 and 5, we see what this shepherd will accomplish. This one, this one, this good shepherd will be our shalom. What the shepherd means to Israel and to the world is captured in this word shalom. Shalom means peace, peace, well-being, peace with God, peace with God's people. And so here we see this, this strong word of shalom that will uh, permeate the land when the Messiah returns to rule and reign. In chapter 6, we be, see the beginning of the third address by the prophet Micah. <clears throat> now, he says, hear the word which the Lord is saying. Once again, hear this word. And here... Uh, Oh, one, 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 uh, uh, one slide ahead here. Uh, going back to the end of chapter 5, we see Micah gives us two beautiful prophetic images of the remnant of God's people, Israel. One, they're going to be like dew. Chapter 5, verse 7, they're going to be like dew that showers from heaven. Dew refreshes the land. And God's people, the remnant of God's people, the believing remnant, will bring refreshment to the land of Israel. But they're also going to be like a lion, like a lion among the beasts of the forest. What do you think of when you think of a, a lion? You think of strength, power. And the Israelite people, when Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom of peace, Israel will be a blessing and they'll be strong like a lion. Now, the third prophetic address. And here we see God's case against his people. God's case against the people who have broken the covenant. And it's like a legal case, and, and God is the prosecutor who's pointing to the people of Israel, and he is accusing them of breaking the covenant. He says in verse 2, the Lord has a case, a legal case, against his people. And so the witnesses are called, the heavens and the earth, the mountains and the hills, and the plaintiff is the Lord. He's the one who's been hurt by Israel's unfaithfulness. Uh, Israel is the defendant in this case. God is using the prophet to accuse his people, Israel, of breaking the covenant. And why should they do this? Especially in light of all that God has done for them. Why should they turn against God, who's been such a faithful God, uh, a faithful God and covenant keeper for his people? Notice he says in verse 4, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I ransomed you from the house of slavery. I set before you leaders like Moses and Aaron and Miriam. I did all of that, and I, I would have done more. But instead of obeying God and keeping the covenant, Israel broke the covenant. Now, the people hear the prophet's message, and they say, oh, we're so sorry. What, what would God want us to do now? What would God be pleased with? And so they offer some alternatives. They say, God, what would you like from us? And they say, how about some burnt offerings? Would that please you? Maybe some yearling calves. Would that be enough? How about thousands of rams? Or maybe rivers full of anointing oil? Or maybe even my firstborn child. Would that be enough to please and satisfy the God of Israel and reflect the genuineness of my, of my repentant heart? And you know the Lord answers. And he has told you, verse 8, O man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Three things. Here's what the Lord requires. Justice. Do justice, he says. In other words, maintain a proper relationship with your fellow man. We talk about social justice today, and that's a biblical concept. 
maintaining a proper relationship, an equitable relationship with fellow man. And the second thing, love kindness, or the word kindness can better be rendered loyalty. Love loyalty. It's that Hebrew word chesed that has the idea of an ongoing commitment, a loyalty and a commitment. And he's saying exercise loyalty in relationship to your fellow man and in relationship to God. Exercise loyalty, covenant loyalty. And finally he says walk humbly with your God. Walk in humble fellowship and humble obedience with your God. He says, you know, God's really not interested in all your sacrifices and, and, uh, and ceremonial worship if you're not loving and doing justice and, and doing and exercising loyalty and walking humbly with God. The ancient Israelites thought it was all a matter of the art of worship, and Micah is saying, no, it's a matter of the heart of worship. Worship comes from the heart, and all your ceremonies of worship are not pleasing to God if it doesn't come from a heart that maintains justice and loyalty and humility. So he says, just do it, just do it. Comes to chapter 7, and he talks about the future of the repentant nation. And chapter 7 concludes in verses 18 through 20 with a wonderful text speaking about God. Who is God like you, who pardons iniquity? God pardons the iniquity of his people, passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession, does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. He will keep, keep your promises, unchanging love to Abraham. So this is a, a text that is used by the Jewish people in preparation for their Day of Atonement. They read this text as they prepare for the Day of Atonement. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? That's what the Day of Atonement is all about. God pardoning iniquity and uh, passing over the sins of his people. And so this text is used on the Day of Atonement to remind the people of the kind of God they love and serve. And it's a wonderful text for, for us as well. We've looked at the book of Micah, but another important prophet at this time is the prophet Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk. So turn just a little, just a one book past uh, Nahum. Uh, you've got Micah, Nahum, and you come to Habakkuk. It's a short little book, only three chapters. But Habakkuk deals with the issue of doubt or perplexity. Have you ever doubted God's existence? Sometimes it's kind of hard to admit that we have our doubts. Have you ever wondered if your prayers are really being heard? Have you ever wondered what life would be like if you weren't a Christian? Maybe you've wondered if heaven really exists after all. Maybe when you die, it's just the end, and there's nothing after that. Have you ever wondered about any of these things or had any doubts? You know, if you have struggled or if you've had some doubts about some of these issues, you can identify with the prophet Habakkuk because Habakkuk is a prophet who has an appeal to the honest doubter, the person who says, yeah, I've got some doubts, but knows how to handle them, as we'll see from the prophet Habakkuk. This book doesn't address Israel or Judah or Judah's enemies. It simply contains the record of Habakkuk's own perplexity and then how he goes to the Lord in prayer. I think from studying this book, we can learn how to face our doubts honestly and to seek God's answers to our doubts. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of when we doubt, but we need to know what to do about our doubts and where to look to resolve those questions of doubt. But let's take a look at the facts on the book. The author, Habakkuk, his name means embrace or embracer. I like to call him Habakkuk the hugger. I imagine him as a big guy who likes to go around giving people a big hug. Habakkuk the hugger or embracer. <laughs> 
He ministered at the same time of Zephaniah and Jeremiah, and we know very little about his life and, and circumstances. We'll date him um, based upon chapter 1, verse 6, a reference to the Chaldean threat against Judah. Chaldean threat. The Chaldeans are also known as the Babylonians. But the Chaldean name refers to the dynasty that ruled Babylon, the geographical region of Babylon. Under historical setting, after the death of King Josiah, the spiritual conditions of the people in Judah rapidly degenerated. Wickedness, injustice, and disregard for the law came to characterize the attitudes and actions of the people of Judah. Although Egypt's pharaoh Necho challenged the ascendancy of the Babylonians, he was defeated at the Battle of Carchemish. Carchemish is a place north of Israel where this important battle took place between the Babylonians and the Egyptians. And the Babylonians won. And when they won, they immediately came further south and captured the land of Judah and took control over the land of Judah. The Babylonians conquered the land in 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar ad advanced to secure his newly won territory and began to exile people and Daniel was among the first of those taken in exile. The purpose of this book is to comfort the people and give them hope during a very tar dark time of Israel's history. Although God would judge his people, he would remember mercy. He's going to remember mercy as we see in chapter 3 verse 2. The book ultimately deals with the dilemma of how a holy God could use a wicked enemy people like the Chaldeans to punish a people more righteous than they. It's a question of God's holiness. How can you be holy and use these wicked Chaldean people. The theme then is the holiness of God, spe specifically God's holiness in judging his people Judah. And then Habakkuk in the area of theology set forth the principle of faith righteousness, a theme that's devel developed by Paul in the New Testament, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and the writer of Hebrews mentions it as well, the just shall live by faith. Martin Luther used that text and uh, embraced that concept in his uh, study of the book of Romans. The book breaks up nicely into two parts. First, Habakkuk's perplexity. And here's where we see him raising questions and, and doubting God. And then we see in chapter 3 his prayer. So his perplexity followed by his prayer. As we begin the book, chapter 2 through 4, he says, How long, O Lord, will I cry for help, and you do not hear? I cry out to you, violence, and you do not save. He's wondering why God doesn't do something to intervene in light of the wickedness that is going on in his day. We look at our own world today, and we might say, Why didn't God intervene in the terrible things that have been taking place in our country and around the world, all these acts of terrorism? Why does evil seem to triumph? Why doesn't God do something about it if he's there and if he cares? So this is the question that, that uh, Habakkuk was raising. And then God gives the answer in verses 5 through 11 where he says, Don't worry, Habakkuk. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans to judge these wicked people who were the Chaldeans. They were originally... Semitic people from southern Babylonia. The term Kaldu is found in Assyrian records and refers to the dynasty of leaders that led this great empire known as the Babylonian Empire. In the Bible, the word Chaldean is used almost as a synonym for Babylonian. But there's a little distinction, a little difference. The Chaldeans were the leaders. They were the the royal family that led and controlled the Babylonian Empire. The term Chaldean refers to the leaders of the people. The term Babylonian takes its name from the city of Babylon that became an empire. The city of Babylon became a Babylonian Empire that was ruled by this Chaldean dynasty. 
Well, who are, what were these Chaldeans like? Verses 7 through 10, we see a description of them. They were swifter than leopards, keener than wolves. Horsemen come galloping, the horsemen from afar. Um, and they sweep through the land like a wind and pass on. So here we see they're described. They're a powerful people. But he, he notes in verse 11, they're going to be held accountable. They will be held accountable. They will be held guilty whose strength is their God. In other words, God is going to use the Chaldeans to discipline and punish the people of Judah, but at the same time, he's going to hold them accountable for their actions. And here's a good principle. Divine sovereignty does not annul human responsibility. God was sovereign over the use of the Chaldeans as an instrument of judgment on his people. But nevertheless, the Chaldeans were accountable for what they did. And God held them uh, accountable for their actions. So uh, Habakkuk is, is wondering now, he says, why didn't you judge your people? And God says, I will, I'm going to use the Chaldeans. And now he says, how can you use such a wicked people as the Chaldeans to discipline a nation, the nation of Judah, who is more righteous than they? How can you use such a wicked nation? And this, these Chaldeans were wicked, as, as seen by these acts of terrorism, blinding people, putting hooks in their mouths. So Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I've got some doubts. I've got some questions. I don't understand. But here's how he responded. Chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand on my guard post. I'll station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch and see what he, God, will speak to me. So he, he knows how to express his doubts, but he also knows how to patiently wait for God's answer. And that's, a, that's an important thing. He's going to wait patiently for God's answer to his questions and his doubts. And so God gives the answer. God gives the answer in chapter 2, verse 4. He says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. The proud one, those are the Chaldeans. Their soul isn't right. God's going to deal with it. But the righteous will live by his faith. The upright man is to live in reliance upon God, and that man will be preserved. God is going to preserve the upright. But the proud and the wicked, by way of contrast, they will perish. The proud and the wicked, verse 4, are going to perish. The upright are going to be preserved. So that's the principle of divine recompense. God is going to judge the wicked. He's going to preserve the righteous. Chapter 2, verse 4 is a verse that appears in the writings of Paul, both in Galatians and in Romans, and also the, the book of Hebrews. But some have suggested that Paul misunderstood Habakkuk's message here. Habakkuk was saying the man justified by faith will live and survive and be blessed. Paul seems to emphasize, by quoting this text, that the justified man lives by faith. Do you see the contrast there? Habakkuk is emphasizing the survival, survivability of the, the righteous person, and Paul is emphasizing that the righteous person lives by faith. There's a different point of emphasis. But could they not both be correct? And I think both are in view. The just shall live by faith, that is by say, be saved. But by faith, they're, they're also going to walk through life. So both of the points, I think, are embraced by Paul. The just will live and be saved on the basis of faith. And by faith, you continue to walk and live your life. It's the faith walk life. So Paul recognized what Habakkuk was saying, he embraced that, but he also emphasized that the faith principle, which was what he was trying to address in Galatians and in Romans. Both of these principles are in view in chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith, that is, be saved, and by faith shall the just, those who are saved, walk in life. We're saved by faith, we live the Christian life by faith. And it's a faith walk life in all respects. He goes on in chapter 2 to 
uh, taunt the Chaldeans as wicked people and to announce a coming judgment upon them. So he has addressed the issue of his doubts in chapters 1 and 2. God has resolved it by saying, yes, the wicked are going to be judged. They're going to be judged by the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk says, oh no, uh, the Chaldeans are more wicked than my people. How can you use such a wicked instrument to judge the people of Judah? And God says, I'm going to use that instrument, but I'm also going to hold them accountable. And the person who repents will be saved, and the person who is wicked will be judged. God will make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, as seen in verse 4. Well, Habakkuk now responds with a prayer. It's a prayer that takes the form of a psalm. And he identifies it as a prayer, verse 1, the prayer of Habakkuk. So it is a prayer. The author is Habakkuk. <clears throat> There's also a musical indicator there. It says, Shagoin Anoth, Shagon Anoth. And Shagon Anoth is a musical indicator which indicates an irregular or wandering song. You might think of it in terms of a ballad. An irregular or wandering song, a ballad. So Habakkuk's prayer is also a song and like a ballad. And so he begins to pray in chapter 3, verse 2, uh, that God would continue to work among his people, but as God works among his people, he prays that God would be tender and remember uh, and exercise mercy in judgment. I've heard the report about you and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk is asking God to be merciful in the midst of the coming judgment, which he knows is going to come upon the land. And then Habakkuk has a vision. In his prayer, he sees a vision of the Lord. He sees God's splendor. In verses 3 and 4, his splendor covers the heavens. The earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. And Habakkuk, Habakkuk has a vision of God, a picture of God's appearing. And as he, he witnesses and experiences this appearing of God, his response is seen in verses 16 through 19. Habakkuk responds, and the first thing, his inward parts tremble. He's trembling fearfully in light of this revelation of God's glorious person. But he also praises God. He says, I must wait quietly for the day of distress. Though the fig tree should not blossom, though there be no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, he says, in spite of all the judgment that will come upon the land, he says, verse 18, I will exult in the Lord. God, you're going to judge. But it hasn't diminished my love for you nor my worship for you. He says, I will exult in the Lord. He anticipated the ruin of Judah by the Chaldeans, but he still praises God, and he praises God as he anticipates this coming judgment. He adds in verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hinds feet, little deer with small feet. He makes me to walk on high places. What he has in mind there are the small deer, these ibex deer, they're more like goats actually than deer but they have feet that are specially prepared to walk on narrow ledges. I remember sitting once uh, down in the Negev at the edge of a cliff having my morning devotions before our student group gathered to go on our field trip for the day. And I was, uh, it was early in the morning and as I sat on the edge of the cliff I noticed something just down below me and it was horns. And there on the narrow ledges below me were these ibex uh, goats or small deer. And they made their way along these narrow edges and eventually up to the top of the cliff. I would have fallen, you would have fallen, but God had prepared these animals in such a way that they could walk on narrow ledges. And that's what he says, the Lord made my feet like hinds feet, like these ibex. Uh, he makes me to walk on the high places. Habakkuk is praising the Lord. 
because he knows that he who leads his people into trial will give them the strength and ability to endure it. God wouldn't create an environment for these mountain goats up on the mountains unless he prepared them for it with these feet that could walk on narrow ledges. And God's not going to lead you into a trial that he won't give you the strength and the ability to endure. He who leads us into trial will give us the strength and the ability to endure it. So what's the takeaway from the book of Habakkuk? I think there's nothing wrong in having some doubts about God. I have doubts all the time. But where do I, what do I do with my doubts? I take my doubts to the Word of God. And I read the Word of God. And I rest in the answers that God's Word gives us. That's what Habakkuk did. He says, I'm going to wait for your answer, O Lord. I'm going to go to the, um, I'm going to go and, uh, and go to my guard post and wait on the rampart and see what you speak to me. Nothing wrong with having doubts, but then let's be patient and let God speak through his words, through his word to resolve our doubts. And then I think there's another lesson here, chapter 2, verse 4. Those who rely upon God will survive and prosper. You might wonder about the world today with all the terrorism and chaos that's going on. Will we survive and prosper? I believe we will. I believe those who rely upon God will survive and prosper. Uh, there, there could be difficult times coming, but God is with us. He'll never leave us and forsake us. So we can be uh, confident in God's presence and in God's power to, to work in our lives. And then finally, with each trial, God will provide the enabling to endure it. He has made my feet like hinds feet. He makes me to walk on high places. God won't give us a trial without preparing it preparing us to be able to endure it. With every trial comes sufficient grace and strength to endure it. Well, a lot of good uh, teaching there from the book of Habakkuk. Let's take a break, and then uh, we'll look at the post-exilic prophets, the prophets that were written after the Babylonian captivity. <laughs> 